Hey there, today we are reading the chapter on race and adoption, and Lori Colangelo starts with, No one has been barred on account of his race from fighting or dying for America. There are no white or colored signs on foxholes or graveyards of battle. President John F. Kennedy Race and Adoption Many mixed race adoptees have written to AM4 wanting to know their true nationality and race. Race matters not only to the current racist administration targeting immigrants and citizens of color, but also to baby brokers' wallets. When a couple seeking to adopt a baby, a white baby, was charged 35000 and a couple seeking a black boy was charged 4000 the image that comes to the Reverend Ken Hutchinson's mind was of a practice outlawed in America 150 years ago, the buying and selling of human beings. And this was a source by Dean Schrabner in Buying and Selling, Preacher Calls Adoption Fees Discriminatory. This was an article in ABC News in 2003. From 1994 to 1996, more than 100 babies were sold to American couples for a reported U.S. 80 thousand per child with the mothers receiving only 18,000 for white babies and the US 1,000 for Roma babies or Indo-Aryan nomadic parents and that was according to RNC agency in 96 by the way um, just to note the birth families actually don't get that much even for the 80,000 they usually get like if they get anything, it's usually no more than two thousand. Um, but yeah, they they usually just don't even get anything. All right, other reports that noted received U.S. thousand dollar for dark skinned children or U.S. what twelve thousand for white skinned and agents charged American couples U.S. sorry twenty thousand per child. And that was according to RFE, RL in 96, as well as Rutgers in ni ni Reuters, Reuters 96, as well as CNN in 96. Same article. Native Americans were the first group targeted for systematic family interference and remain the most impacted ethnic and or racial group in America, as they were similarly targeted in Canada. Interference in Native American families dates back to the colonial period when Indian children were removed from homes and educated in white boarding schools. The book Lost Bird of Wounded Knee by Renee Sampson Flood is set is told through the sad life of Sinkala Nuni Lost Bird, an infant who survived the eighteen ninety wounded knee massacre of at least a hundred and fifty Lakota Sioux men women and children, only to be adopted by a white general as a political stepping stone for his ambitions, later abandoned to a miserable life of a harsh boarding school, discrimination being passed among many men, a sideshow attraction in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, and vaudeville, and dying at the age of 29 of diseases which she had no immunity from. In the book Stolen from Our Embrace, co-authors Suzanne Portner and Ernie Cray investigate the impact of residential schools and the 60s groups, where in the 1960s, many Canadian First Nation children were taken from their families and adopted into white homes, largely because First Nation parents were not seen as fit, or in the case of Cray, were not able to to access the same services as white families and suffered effects of fetal alcohol syndrome disorder, spectrum disorder, abuse, and the effects of policies that have discriminated against First Nation people for generations. The strategy of removing Native American children from their homes in the U.S. to assimilate them rem remained strong until the mid-1970s. Many children were adopted out to white families. Often, though, established organizations like the Child Welfare League Indian P 
project, CWLIA, Indian babies were also simply sold to white couples on the black market. That's true. In 1978, Congress passed the Indian Child Welfare Act. Seeking to reverse the policies that led to the massive removal of Indian children from homes. As a result, the number of Indian children in out-of-home care outside the tribal community dropped from one-third to one-fifth. As Native Americans became politically empowered, the autonomy granted to their families has increased. The California Bill, AB 1325, by Beale and Cook was signed into law on October 11th, 2009 and went into effect July 1st, 2010, allowing tribal customary adoption, an informal process for American Indian children in foster care. It is significant that such adoptions were, are permitted without termination of parental rights, yet the same force and effect as an order of adoption. So while the legislation and apparently American Civil Law Liberties Union, ACLU, supported Native American adoptees' rights to have pre-adoption information, meaning to identify their tribe of origin, that non-Natives were not permitted. They were also condoned taking Native American children for the adoption in manner that would be illegal in non-Native adoptions. Native American transracial adoptees tell their stories by Rita J. Simon and Rachel Hernandez is a collection of interviews given by adults ages 25 to 59. While none of these interviewed seem to embrace the tragedy of lost bird, none claim to have left felt wholly intact by their experience of a transracial adoption. It is estimated that several thousand Native American children are adopted each year by thousands who are not Natives and have no ties to tribal communities. The appropriateness of the adoptions is a highly contested socio-cultural issue and analogs to concern about the wisdom of international transracial adoptions. And the source is Joan Heffitz. Hollinger, Adoption Law, Adoptions of Native American Children. Congress is empowered to regulate family law matters affecting tribal man members. The Indian Child Welfare Act, ICWA, of 1978 governs many of the jurisdictional and substantive aspects of adoptions of Native American children superseding state laws that would otherwise be applicable in, in construing ICWA's dual mandate to preserve tribal integrity and promote welfare of Native American children. State and federal courts have yet to achieve comfortable balance among the potentially conflicting principles of tribal survival, child welfare, and parental autonomy. This conflict is especially troublesome when parents of Native American argues that a child who has not previously lived in a tribal community should be placed on a reservation. Um, yeah, so here's the thing. I can tell you from my experience, I am Native. I am Apache. Um, my birth father was not registered with the tribe, and I don't think they'll ever let him register. But my, I don't know if his mom was, but my great-grandfather was registered and actually lived on the reservation with my half-brother. Um, my brother, my half-brother was adopted by my great-grandfather. Um, and I don't know if I'll ever be able to connect with that side. It's very difficult in the process, especially with reconnecting with your tribe, because, well, one, I've lived so far, and two, there's only so much you can gather when you're, um, not there in person. So having no 
contact with my tribe hurts um, and it feels so distant now no my parents are not native um, and yes I I'm weight passing and that adds a different aspect in it because I'm not in sh- ashamed of how I look but I will say that when it comes to that native side it hurts that's where I hurt the most um, and it sucks it sucks because especially when this stuff is not well known I feel like had my birth mom known proof and known that it was going to hurt me the most she probably would have sent me there but this stuff isn't well known and that's a problem so for African American children they were initially excluded from child welfare practices many African American children in the pre-civil war south were subjected to apprenticeship laws whereby the parent often coerced sold the labor of the child to a white master following the civil war the child's labor was often sold to the master who had formerly owned her outright or them outright the parent received a nominal amount and the child said to receive basic care and instruction to, in the skill this quote-unquote skill consisted of men- menial labor in the house or in the field and often the quote-unquote care that the child received was inhumane largely ignored by the quote-unquote baby savers until the mid-1950s partly because traditionally black families took care of their own and mostly because black children were not wanted by white adopters during the rediscovery of child abuse and neglect african americans children once again began to be removed from their homes placed in a system that was viciously discriminated against them. The 1970s saw an overall browning of the child welfare system, and by 1973, 52% of the children in New York City's foster care system were African American. By the way, we're in 2022, right? And when my mom worked in the system, so in New York City in the 90s, and then my witness from it you know just as an outsider it still is very much like this and very much discriminatory and it's gross upon removal from their homes new york city's african-american children were placed in a system run by private religious organizations as these agencies gave priority in services so uh sorry in services first to members of their own religion second to other white children, and last to African-American children. African-American kids were disproportionately placed in less than desirable placements, and their chances of being adopted were exceedingly slim. The private or voluntary agencies adhered to those practices, despite the fact that they received 90% of their funding from the city. Large religious organizations their portfolios rich with donations milked the city for money to provide care and services for children while sim- stim- simul- simultaneously denying these children proper care due to lack of funds of course this burden was felt more sharply by african-american children african-american children were less likely to be adopted resulting in a series of increasingly harmful placements so that still holds true, um, but I also want to know from the hopeful adoptive parents, there's also discrimination um, as well as to foster parents where even in today's world, there's not as many African American families, you know, um, helping um, and same goes with uh, Asian families or natives. Well, natives have their own thing, right? So I'm seeing non-registered natives. Um, It can be very, very harmful to not mirror all that. And that they will discriminate against these, these families. 
Okay. Excerpted from Transracial Abductees Outcome of Intercountry Adoptions by Tobias Hubinet, a Korean adoptee living in Stockholm, Sweden. The most scientific of studies on intercountry adoptees' outcomes were conducted in Sweden. In spite of the adult adoptees in the study having been adopted to couples belonging to the Swedish elite, it was estimated that 90% of the adopters belong to the upper and middle classes. In spite of this, 6.6 of the intercountry adoptees had a post-secondary education of three years or more compared to 20% of biological children of the adopters with whom they grew up as siblings. Intercountry adoption adoptees less often have children and those who are parents are more often living without their children if they are males or as single parents if they are females. I'm definitely a single parent. That's quite interesting. Males are often than females have indicators of social maladjustment. Moreover, epidemiological studies show high levels of psychiatric illness, addiction, criminality, and suicide compared to the control groups. Females, more often than males, have indicators of poor mental health. The most shocking finding was a record high odds of a five times ratio of five times for suicide compared to ethnic Swedes. In an international perspective, only compared to the staggering suicide rates registered among indigenous people in North America and Oceania, which makes parallels to cultural genocide. For historical perspective, Tobias Hubinet explains the scope of the Holocaust created such a shock that the West was forced to change its worldview from open racism to the idea of equality for all races, at least theoretically. This idea destroyed the world order that dominated the last 500 years. That the West had the right to conquer, exterminate, and rule over non-white people. Decolonization was followed by violent conflicts, and the first intercountry adoptees soon started to arrive. Korea has been far the largest supplier of foreign babies from the U.S. adoption market. 62% of all babies adopted abroad are South Korean. At first, the women do not want to give up their babies. According to the questionnaire distributed, 90% want to keep the babies, says Kim Yong-suk, the director of A. Ron Won, but after counseling and quote-unquote counseling, perhaps 10% will keep them. In a study by Evan B. Donaldson Institute, 80% of Korean adoptees experience discrimination from strangers, 75% from classmates, 39 from teachers, and 80% grew up thinking of themselves as white or wishing they were white. One woman reported despite that her adopter was heavily engaged in tracing her own Swedish genealogy, her doctor would get upset with me because I wanted to find out who I was. On January 22, 2002, Dale Edmund asked, Are Caucasian families able to parent their Asian-born adopted children effectively? As an Asian-American adoptive parent of an internationally adopted Asian child, I feel a certain responsibility to speak out on the issue that I have witnessed on numerous occasions. The issue of subtle racism on the part of the Caucasian parents towards their Asian children. And that was taken from the brochure of adopted and fostered adults worldwide of the African dysphoria um, or you can find it on afaad.wordpress.com. So, um, before I end, I just want to tell you guys a little story. Um, this is what I've heard from Asian adoptees. Specifically, my cousin was the one that explained it the best. 
he was also adopted from Korea. And now granted, he was adopted to Kentucky, um, to Lexington. So while it is a city, it's still not a very large, culturally diverse city. Um, and he always said that, you know, he never felt, he never felt white enough to be in America. Like, he, he never felt like he was enough. And then when he returned to Korea, he was there for a year and he did some trips, you know, to find birth family and things like that. Um, he was not Asian enough. And that's really hard. He's basically being told from two different sides, he's just not enough. And we already feel that as adoptees. But to get that from your own culture is hard. Now, comparatively, I will say this from my trying to reconnect with my Apache side. I don't so much get that. I think I've gotten one comment from supposedly an indigenous person, but I don't take it to heart because everyone else I've talked to that is indigenous, they're welcoming. 